afternoon and welcome to the 2016 Science and Technology webinar, Neonics and Pollinators, Their Impact on the Produce Industry. My name is Bob Whitaker and I'm the Chief Science and Technology Officer here at PMA. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our technology portfolio sponsor, Bear Crop Science, for their support. You know, the subject of neonicotinoid insecticides, or neonics as they've been commonly called, and the purported impact on the decline of the honeybee population has been gaining increased media attention in the past few years. However, recent studies show that colonies may not be as compromised as originally thought. As many fruit and vegetable commodities depend on honeybees for production, neonix and their use has become an important topic for our industry. Today we're very fortunate indeed to be joined by Dr. Jeff Harris, Assistant Extension and Research Professor from Mississippi State University, who will review the importance of honeybees to the produce industry, colony collapse disorder, and neonics. Hopefully along the way we can determine what the facts are and what might be sometimes uh, considered myth. So without further ado, let's get started, and uh, Jeff, please take it away. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, before we get started, let me just tell the audience a little bit about myself. I have 43 years of experience with honeybees. Uh, started when I was a very small child. Um, I've done research with them uh, for 15 to 20 years at the USDA in Baton Rouge at the Honeybee Breeding Lab, and now I'm in Starkville, Mississippi at Mississippi State University as their extension honeybee guy. So I've had a, quite an extensive experience with honeybees uh, throughout my entire life. So um, that's just a little bit about me. So, so today's topic is honeybees and neonicotinoids, and as, as Bob said, um, Honeybees has sort of been in the press um, because we've had some episodes of heavy, heavy colony losses in the United States in our commercial beekeeping industry. And <clears throat> for various reasons or another, um, many factors are involved in this, but for some reason neonicotinoids were being uh, singled out by some people as the major factor determiner of honeybee death in the United States. And one of the main points I want to show you is that this certainly is not the case. This is not true. I'm not saying that these chemicals don't have the potential, but there certainly is no evidence, no, no hard data to suggest that this has been the major cause of, of some of the colony losses that we've had in the United States uh, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So I want that point to be made across uh, uh, just from the start. Um, but let me just review a little bit about basics about honeybees just so that we uh, all are, uh, know a little bit more about them. Um, honeybees visit flowers to gather two types of food. They gather nectar which they take back and convert to honey. And this is sort of the energy of their diet. It's the, if you look at a human diet as a meat and potato diet, for the honeybee, the honey is their potato. It's their energy and starch food. And the individual bees need this honey to survive on a daily basis. And this is also how groups of honeybees survive the winter. They basically store up honey and then they use access it during the winter so they don't starve to death and they generate heat and stay warm. Uh, I'm going to give you some uh, ideas of national honey production. This is domestic honey production for 2010. And I'm giving you 2010 because I want to compare it to the value of honeybees as pollinators of our produce crops. Uh, um, and the last time that that was determined by the University of Cornell was in 2010. So I just wanted to pick the same year so you can get an idea of the value, of the comparative value of honey versus the pollination effort of honeybees. So in 2010, just under $300 million uh, in domestic honey production for the whole United States uh, from the activity of honeybees. Um, so now when we go to the other food source that bees get, or the other food that bees get from flowers, is the pollen itself. And this is the meat of their diet. Uh, just as if when you eat a steak, you get essential amino acids, you get uh, cholesterol, you get certain vitamins and certain minerals out of protein sources, well, honeybees get it out of their pollen. They get the 10 essential amino acids, uh, they get, they get campisterol, their form of cholesterol, vitamins, and so forth, and they basically cannot grow uh, new honeybees without having pollen. So it's definitely the meat of their, their diet. And of course, the benefit to us is in their act of collecting pollen, they're actually pollinating our crops for us. And uh, you may not be aware of this, but there are many commercial beekeeping families, and these are just three shown here, who have migratory beekeeping routes. Uh, these beekeeping routes take them all around the country. And I'll just pick one that I'm familiar with. Richard Aidy is actually the biggest beekeeper in the world. Uh, he has about 90,000 colonies. It varies, but he holds his operation about 90,000 colonies. 
His home base is up here in South Dakota. They go to California to pollen almonds, and they do that in February, March, and then they come to Mississippi at the end of that, uh, it basically middle of March after pollinating almonds, and they let their bees fatten up a little bit, and then they split them and take them up to South Dakota to make honey production. So they have a little triangular route. Um, just gives you an idea how migratory some people are with their bees. And you'll see the importance of migratory pollination. And the, the route in white is, is this crazy family I know from Louisiana, and they take about 18,000 colonies on this route. You'll see in this slide, they start off wintering in Louisiana, then they go to almonds in February, they go back to Louisiana to rest a little bit, and then they go to New York to pollinate apples, uh, and after apples they go to Maine and do low bush blueberries, and then they go do cranberries in Massachusetts, then they get to western New York, let's say about August, and then they're back in Louisiana by October. And they do this year after year, and every time they put their colonies down on the crop, they're getting paid for their pollination service. And what are the benefits to the grower for paying for this bee pollination? Well, it's been shown in many, many studies when you <clears throat> use bees or don't, uh, you can actually get more fruit and nuts in many of these crops. Um, so you get better qu quantity, you also get finer quality. And the concept of this is that these bees are often contracted and put on the ground about 10 days in front of the bloom, so the bees are there, and when the, when the plants bloom, the optimal physiology of the plant they get hit by pollinators, which often leads to a finer quality of the, of the fruit that's produced. And then, this is important for the hand-picked fruit industry. When honeybees are brought to many crops, they pollinate the flowers on a branch almost simultaneously, and if the conditions are right, the fruit will develop very uniformly. And if there's a hand picker coming by, he doesn't have to come back to that same branch. He gets all the ripe fruit at one time. So uniform ripening is very important. And then in some some commodities you actually get faster ripening of the fruit. And these are all benefits that have been documented from bringing honeybees in as pollinators. <coughs> um, this is just a list of many of those commodities that honeybees have um, helped fruits and nuts here. Almonds are by far the most important crop uh, needing honeybees. Uh, you cannot produce almonds in the United States without honeybees. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Many of your vegetable seed crops, like when you buy a, a package of asparagus seeds from your local garden center, those seed crops are produced by honeybees crossing different varieties of plants. Um, and then forage crops, um, these are often also pollinated by honeybees, and this is important as, as feed in the Midwest for dairy and, and livestock, and then these are often very good honeys as well from the beekeeper's point of view. This shows many of the same commodities, and, and next to them is the number of colonies used annually to pollinate the crop. So look at almonds. 1.2 million colonies of honeybees are used to pollinate the almond crop. And just to give you a perspective, there's only 2.6 million colonies of honeybees managed by commercial beekeepers in the United States. So almost half of them are going to almonds. So that tells you how important some of these crops can be in terms of beekeeping income. And then the next closest one is apples, which is around 300,000 colonies uh, needed to pollinate the apple crop in the United States. So and this just rounds out the list, um, just trying to give you an idea that, that yes, indeed, growers are paying beekeepers to bring bees in. What's the total value of this? <coughs> well, the last time it was estimated was 2010, as I mentioned, and if you remember, there was less than $300 million of honey produced. Well, if you look at the pollination from honeybees, uh, it's about $19 billion worth. So considerably, it's 60 times more the value of the honey that was produced. The non-apis insects here is another 10 billion, and most of those were leafcutter bees. So it just gives you an idea of how important bees are to pollination. Now, colony collapse disorder. Well, this was a particular episode in basically 2006 to 2010 when average colony losses in the United States exceeded, you know, 35%. And many commercial beekeepers lost greater than that. And it was peculiar symptoms. Bees were lost rapidly, leaving only a handful of bees, and oftentimes the honey crop remained on the colonies. Um, and it became known as colony collapse disorder. It scared a lot of beekeepers, uh, and then some money was thrown at it by USDA, ARS, and other researchers. And what happened was there was a five-year study or so looking at what are the causes of this. Everybody was afraid there was a new boogeyman, some kind of new parasite or pest that we didn't know about. So there was a lot of investigation, and, but what came out of it was basically this, is that these bees died because they had multiple stressors piled on them. Our commercial beekeeping industry had 
multiple stressors, and not any one beekeeper has the same stressors. So, for example, one beekeeper may have a lot of transportation stress because he moves his bees long distances, but he also has some nutritional issues or he had a virus from varroa mites, whereas another beekeeper may have had a nutritional problem or uh, a fungal disease. This nosema is a fungal disease or some kind of exposure to pesticides, and all those stressors layered together were leading to these large increases in mortality. Now, if you ask the scientists, and most, most, most scientists in the world agree that the major killer of honeybees worldwide by itself is the varroa mite, that's the B-A-R-R-O-A, -R -R is a parasitic mite, and the viruses it vectors to our bees. Those are the major killers in the world. That, that couplet, varroa mite and viruses, kills millions of colonies a year in the world. And just to give you an idea, this is the mite. It's the reddish-brown critter on the back of this honeybee. It's actually a fairly large mite. I'm not going to dwell on the life cycle, but I want to tell you where the harm is caused. Um, the mite really doesn't hurt the adult bees when it's sucking on its blood. Where the damage occurs is when the mite invades the brood cell, and that's the place where the baby, baby bees are growing up. Uh, this little white grub is a baby honeybee in step one, and that baby honeybee is going to pupate and become an adult. Well, the mite invades the brood cell where that bee is developing and starts to suck the blood of that bee to make eggs and create its own family, and all the members of the family are sucking on that developing honeybee. And that's when the damage occurs. And what happens is all those feeding mites vector viruses to our bees. And if you look at that worker bee on the right, it has shriveled up wings and she looks very runty and small. She has a deformed wing virus, and it's one of the major viruses associated with bee deaths related to varroa mites. And I'm not going to dwell on this. I can tell you this, there's actually been 20 different viruses found. This is an old slide associated with the varroa mite, and it looks like four or five of them are the ones that lead to the death of our bees, ultimately. We don't have antiviral drugs, so the only way we can control this mite, uh, this, the viral diseases, is to control the mite. And we use, unfortunately, we use pesticides to do that. So can you imagine beekeepers are hanging pesticides in their colonies to control a mite? The idea is these pesticides are tweaked, uh, to basically have a greater effect on the mite than the bee, but guess what? Over time, we're finding that these chemicals that our own beekeepers are using actually have health effects on the bees themselves. So that's an added insult from the varroa mite situation. I'm going to kind of skip this. This just tells you one of the problems with, well, I won't skip it. I'll just go fast. Uh, one of the problems with chemicals we've used to control mites is that these pesticides we're using to control mites actually end up in our beeswax. This is measurements of, just look at the top two lines. 98% of the combs that were examined randomly in this country had a pyrethroid, that's the flavalinate, and an organophosphate, cumaphos, in them when they were sampled in 2010. And those chemicals are coming from the miticides that beekeepers are using to kill mites. So this just gives you an idea that beekeepers themselves um, actually are putting pesticides in their colonies that can be a problem. And then <clears throat> there's been some nutritional issues. Um, it looks like honeybees do much better when they have access to many different flowers blooming at one time. And a lot of our activities as humans have led to basically environments where there's only one, one type of plant blooming at a time. And this leads to malnutrition. And this is an added factor to this colony collapse disorder, or CCD. So there's a lot of things going on. Now I want to skip to pesticides because they've kind of been singled out. And what I want to kind of do now is come to Mississippi because I think I have an interesting scenario to show you in that our commercial beekeepers here actually rely on soybeans and cotton, which are heavily farmed and sprayed agronomic crops to get their major honey crops. They depend on them. Their livelihoods depend on soybeans in particular, but cotton's also pretty nice honey. And here's the risk. Uh, the farms in our Mississippi Delta are very large, anywhere from 10 to 14,000 acres is an average family farm. They can't spray those with ground rigs very efficiently, so most of the pesticides in the, in the Mississippi Delta are sprayed by aerial applicators, airplanes. And so there's a bigger chance of drift and bee kills from direct drift on the bee colonies. So we do a lot of communication with farmers and beekeepers about placing colonies in safer places on these farms to avoid this kind of kill, and we're making a lot of headway on that. But 
let's get to the neonic part of this. And what I'm going to do is I stole a graduate student's uh, talk here. He's, I'm on his PhD committee who's been looking at honeybees in agricultural environments in, in, um, in the Mississippi Delta. And I don't want to dwell too much on his data. I just want to show you some patterns. But here's what a neonicotinoid is. These are insecticides that mimic the actions of nicotine and kill insects. Um, they are put on seeds, coated on the seeds that basically protect the seedling as it starts to grow from insects that eat seedlings. And so it's actually seed treatment on the left side of the, of the diagram. They plant the, the seeds, the material soak into the plant, it, it, the toxins get into the plant tissue, and then if an insect like a caterpillar tries to eat the plant, it will die before there's much damage to the plant. That's the idea behind these. What's worrying people is, do these systemic insecticides stay in the plant tissue and end up in nectar and pollen, which will kill our pollinators? And I can say the answer is yes, it does. It can kill some pollinators. I'm specifically a honeybee biologist, and the, the question is, is this the major cause for honeybee decline? And it turns out the answer there is no. Um, so let's just look at some of the data. Here's This is actually data they did before, um, experiments they did before, uh, um, I joined here in Mississippi. But they basically collected pollen from three different plants, flowers and or pollen from three different plants, corn, cotton, and soybean. And they basically found that, yes, corn pollen tends to have these neonicotinoids in the pollen. And the levels we were finding up to six parts per billion is similar to what they find in the Midwest from corn pollen. But happy to us, because our beekeepers depend so much on cotton and soybean, is we basically didn't find any neonicotinoids of any significance in cotton, nectar, or pollen, and not in soybean flowers at all. So that was a relief to us because these are some of our major honey crops in Mississippi. <clears throat> but to go a step beyond, what the graduate student wanted to do was to actually monitor the plants as they grow, look at the amount of these materials in the plants, and see how they degrade just before the bloom, and see how much is there when the plant starts to bloom. So I'm about to show you a bunch of data slides. We're not going to get too hung up in the actual numbers, but basically if it's high, if it's a high brown bar, that means there's a lot of the material there. And then as we go through time, what we're doing is the plant is getting taller as it's going to the right. And in the case of corn, when you see VT, that means the corn is tasseling or blooming. And this will be the pattern for the other three crops. We're going to, basically the plant is small at V1 and it's growing to a bloom on the right side. And so you can see what's happening in this case, the material's declining with time. And by the time the corn is blooming, there's hardly any material at all in the plant tissue. And we did different doses of corn, and just just look at another dose. And I'm just going to quickly go through this. And you just see the pattern is the same. It's not always zero. In this case, this is the highest rate of this neonicotinoid that was used. And yes, at, at, at the tasseling of corn, when the pollen is produced, yep, there's some neonicotinoid in there, and we already know that it ends up in the pollen. So, so that's what he did with corn. Well, he did the same thing with cotton. And you can see all the way out to bloom, you get the same kind of pattern. This material is decreasing rapidly through time. Again, a different rate. And you get the idea. Here's soybean. And luckily for us, by the time you get out to blooming and stuff in soybean and cotton, this material seems to be gone. So in the case of our agronomic crops, especially those two that our beekeepers rely on the most, the seed treatment neonicotinoids are basically not showing up in the nectar and pollen and really fairly pose a small risk for them. Uh, these are just some of the other findings of the study that I won't dwell on. Um, the other thing the student did, and he, I told them this has already been done, but they wanted to go ahead and do it, and that was just sort of say, where are the honeybees in these fields? Because in the, in the Mississippi Delta, all three of these crops are grown simultaneously on these farms. So they wanted to say, where, where are the honeybees? And so they just did a simple screening of, uh, <clears throat> they basically divided the day into morning, midday, and evening with these intervals, and they scouted some 82 farms in these three states. And you can see how it's broken down, cornfields, cotton, and so forth. And they just basically develop a standard way of walking through the fields um, and looking at what bees are visiting the flowers at the time, honeybees, and, and counted them to estimate how many honeybees per hectare are occurring in these fields and where are they occurring. And so here's how they did it. They would take three students. They had hand counters, and sometimes they would actually catch some if there was any doubt if it was a honeybee just to make sure it was honeybees they were counting. And they estimated, you know, 
how many bees were seen as they walked through the field. And here's what they found. They found that it, was, it didn't matter where they were in the field, they had the same number statistically. Um, and they, but here's the most important thing, is where, <coughs> where were they finding them and what time of day? And it turns out midday, which is what I told them to expect. Um, especially in corn, here's cotton, midday. This would be around lunchtime, noon. And then soybeans, the most important one, because this is the biggest honey producing crop, again, midday. Let me speed up because I'm taking a little too long. Basically what they found is that honeybees are more active foraging in these fields at midday and the crop that had the most bees in it, guess what, was soybean because uh, it, it's, it's the favorite crop for bees in this area. So what this led to was some conclusions uh, from this study was basically the endocastoid seed treatments basically pose very little risk to honeybees in our area. Um, in particular cotton and soybean because they very little of the material ended up in the pollen and nectar which is what the bees are feeding on. Um, they did suggest that perhaps because bees are flying uh, mostly in the middle of the day the best time to apply would be late in the evening if, if possible to allow the insecticides to act and break down overnight and have lower impact on bees. If they spray in the middle of the day the bees might contact it and this is just something U.S. agriculture needs both of these things. We need pesticides for weed management. We also need our pollinators. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. We just need better communication between our beekeepers and our growers. And running out of time, I took a little too long, I'm sorry. But I do want to go over some myths. And, and, then, um, and the biggest ones are these. Um, you hear that honeybees are dying from the planet, uh, especially in the press in the last decade or so. I sort of get this notion, well, this certainly isn't true. The actual numbers are from the FAO of the UN is that numbers of honeybees have actually grown 20 million colonies in the last decade or so. And then the next part of the myth is if honeybees dies, humans will die within days to weeks because we'll starve to death. Well, all you have to do is think about the top 10 food crops that feed the world and these things like wheat, corn, barley, rice, soybean, and whatever, they don't need a pollinator. They're wind or self-fertile or wind pollinated. So I really like to smack the hands of beekeepers that say this because it actually undermines our credibility when we say things that aren't true. We should be proud of that $19 billion of pollination that beekeepers contribute to the U.S. agriculture, but don't exaggerate it, <laughs> is kind of what I say. And then, for some reason, people have this notion that colony losses of honeybees in the United States are strongly correlated to the use of neonicotinoids. This is certainly not true. There's just no data to support that. And even in studies where they fed bees, neonics, uh, in, in field-relevant doses, you can't even kill them. Um, and so I know I've talked a little too long, um, but that's, that's what I had to say. And these are, these are co-workers of mine that help with the graduate student work. Uh, and so I thank you for your listening. And I hope I at least uh, gave you an idea of sort of the real relationship between neonics and honeybees and sort of a better appreciation that honeybees aren't as dire straits as it may sound when you listen to the news. Uh, thanks for your time. All right. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate that uh, presentation. It certainly addressed a lot of the areas that um, we've heard about and perhaps sets some light on, you know, facts from what may become myth. So uh, this is a good time to open it up for discussion. Um, for those of you who are listening, if you want to enter a question, type your question in the chat box area at the bottom left of the window and then just click send and I'll be watching for them and I can work them um, uh, into the discussion. I've got a, a question, you know, and this is just a, a general one because I've been following this in the, in the literature for the last few years uh, as we've, at PMA, have looked how, at how to best engage in this issue because, you know, as you've indicated, um, you know, bee pollination is so important to the to the produce industry, and I was just wondering, perhaps in your opinion, I mean, why is there so much diverse scientific opinion about the effects of neonics and honeybees? I mean, you're very clear on what you just said. Now, the data is is pretty compelling in the example you gave in in Mississippi, but why do you suppose so much um, controversy is cropped up around this, Jeff? Well, I think I think let's let's just back away from honeybees for a second, and, and I'll just say one of the one of the best scientific studies that was done with it's hard to do experiments with whole farms, but a Swedish study recently looked at um, canola that was seed treated, and they looked at the effects on honeybees, bumblebees, and leafcutter bees, and they found pretty much what we find here that that the seed treated canola had no effect on honeybees at all; they just thrived. 
but at the same time, it had detrimental effects on both the bumblebee and the leaf cutter. Uh, so it may be that honeybees, for example, at the colony level are able to, con you know, honeybees have much bigger colonies than those other two bees. The leaf cutters are more or less solitary bees, bumblebees are much smaller nests. And it may be that honeybees are so large at a colony level that they have some kind of mechanisms for compensating to exposure to these, these toxins that let them better able to survive and we see no measurable harm to them. Um, that's one possibility. Uh, I think another possibility is too is the way studies are done. It's very difficult to do field studies with these animals and control what they're contacting because bees can fly two miles from their colony to, to contact food and you're trying to do a control test. Well, if they can go to flowers that you can't control, you don't know what they're getting into and it's just a mess. You know, it's hard to do that kind of work. So what people end up doing is doing a lot of lab experiments and it's very easy. I can take honeybees into the lab and kill them with any insecticide. I can feed them different doses of this and that and whatever. The question is, what's field relevant? What do they actually see in their environment? Um, and that's the hard part. So you get a lot of people who are doing experiments in laboratories or semi-field plots where they can demonstrate strong effects on bees from in insecticides, neonics and otherwise. And yet when you go to the real environment where the bees are operating, you don't see necessarily the same effects. And so that's why you got such a wide-ranging opinions sometimes. But um, as a field biologist, I kind of like to look at, you know, okay, what's the animal? What's happening to the animals in the field they're in? Um, and start there. And it's just hard to relate those two realms, the laboratory where you're treating individual bees with insecticides to whole colonies out in the field. It, it's very difficult. It's hard. And that's why you get such wide-ranging views, even among scientists, about what's going on. You know, expand upon that a little bit. I mean, um, you talked a little bit about the rural mic and the fact that, uh, you know, basically beekeepers are using um, an insecticide to try to control the mites, but it turns out that that also has an impact on the bee. Has anybody been able to study that phenomenon and look at proper treatment? I mean, if the rural mite is the biggest threat, I guess, to bee colonies, um, then what kind of research is being done in order to uh, maybe think of uh, better treatments for the for the mite okay. or ways to you know even even handle the bees so that they're not so uh, impacted by that treatment? Yes. Yeah, so so when we first got varroa mites back about 25 years ago, um, as an emergency situation, um, basically we were treating our bees with a pyrethroid and organophosphate, and these are pretty harsh neurochemical. Um, insecticides, and but it saved our industry. Um, and what we've come to realize is some of these chemicals are contaminating our beeswax because they're strongly lipophilic or fat soluble, and beeswax is nothing but you know fat. So the beeswax and beekeepers like to use their combs over and over and over again for years. So over time, many of these chemicals are building up in our combs. And the question was, well, what's the health effects? Well, a lot of research is going on on that right now, just to determine what this is. But because of that scare, there's been a shift from using those kind of materials uh, to control the mites, and, and beekeepers are shifting to things that are more, are less likely to con contaminate our cones and a little bit more natural in the sense that they're things that we can find in honey. For example, they, they're treating with oxalic acid or formic acids, which are strong organic acids that can have harmful effects on bees and mites and so forth. But they don't contaminate our combs, and if used properly, they seem to do a pretty good job in controlling the mites without causing long-term health effects by residue in combs. So, so that's been the kind of shift that's going on, but I can say this. We could certainly need use safer insecticides because the use of formic acid and oxalic acid, although they have the benefits I just described, what worries me about them is they're harsh organic acids and in, improperly used. Um, beekeepers can burn themselves and burn their airways and burn their bees. So uh, mm -hmm. nothing's perfect here, but it's, at least people are thinking and going away from chemicals that might lead to long-term health effects in the bees. Great. Now, I'd like to shift to the other side. I mean, there's always, uh, well, the genetics, and we have to think of the genetics of all parties involved, right, when we do these things. So we talk about the bees. But I, I noticed in the, some of the data that you presented, um, uh, specifically looking at um, your know, time of day uh, when, when this is active um, and the differences that, that can occur between different types of crop. But I was wondering, has anybody yet looked 
for variation uh, within crops. And so there are other are there varieties that are more or less um, more or less capable of taking up nicotine systemically? Um, so, or, or maybe perhaps degrade them. Um, that's probably a better way of looking at it. Uh, degrade them quicker um, oh, yeah. than some of the ones that are there today. Has anybody looked at that angle of it yet? You know, uh, that's an interesting question. You know, somebody may be, but I don't know about it. Um, that's interesting thought uh, that there might be differences in in in, in uh, degradation rates of these materials in different varieties of soybean or mm -hmm. cotton or whatever. Um, I don't know of anybody looking into that, but you know, just because I don't know doesn't mean someone's not. But that's an interesting thought, and um, I'll say this: we've looked at the other side. We've looked at okay, are, are there are there variations in the attractiveness of soybean varieties to honeybees? And we're certainly finding that there are different nectar qualities okay. in the plant. So if you look at so you can look at it that way too. Or how attractive are these plants to bees? Well, we've, we're looking right now. We're looking at that side of it, but it's interesting thought you have. Um, and I imagine a good researcher out there has had that thought. I just don't know about it. Yeah. It just seems sometimes to me we forget about looking at the genetics of all parties. Yeah. And yeah. We probably miss some opportunities, you know, to select varieties for things that we really haven't thought about before. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good point. You know, uh, the other thing that really uh, caught my eye, and it was one of the, one of the very first uh, slides you showed, is that um, I didn't realize that bees are so itinerant, that they're, they're moving around the, the country yeah. Uh, to hit various crops. I mean, it makes sense. I, I can see why um, that business would, would do that and and, um, and keep moving all the time because you gotta you got to keep the bees working, I guess. And um, But that in itself seems to me like it could represent a number of different challenges, some of which um, you yeah. met. Well, I, 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 I agree with you. And in fact, as a lover of honeybees, it's the part of our industry I like the least. Um, uh -huh. If you think about a honeybee, they they were designed to live in trees, and trees don't move. And right. and, and so the stresses we're putting on them. Um, if you if you look if you had looked at the slide with the the group that I I went over that went uh, the the white route that went to California right. and then went to out that's eight thousand miles, and they lose they literally lose one third of their bees at the end of this trip, or through the throughout the ordeal, and then. Just if you've ever been on, near a bee truck when they un take the net off, it's amazing. There, there are just millions of bees in the air. There's chaos all around. Uh, queen, you know, it's just a mess, and it, it really stresses bees. And it's funny. I've mentioned this idea to commercial beekeepers that you're really stressing your bees. Oh no, no, we've done this for 25, 30 years. Well, well, there was a study just came out from actually Dave Tarpey from North Carolina State that talked about transportation stress and how hard it is on bees. And it's like to me, it's a no-brainer. Because you're taking an animal that wants to be in a tree that doesn't move, and you're bouncing it down the road for thousands of miles, you're going to stress the animal. Um, but I guess the beekeepers have determined the profitability of the trips uh, being paid for the pollination service, and they know how to rebound. When beekeepers, this is one thing our commercial beekeepers are really good at. When they lose bees to whatever the cause, disease, pesticide, or whatever, they're very good at making new colonies from existing ones. Um, that's that's a skill set that they they have perfected. So they know how to take their losses and turn them into new bees uh, and recover. Explain that a little bit to me. What do you, what do you mean by? I'm not, I'm not an entomologist, but sure. what do you mean by making new colonies from uh, from current ones? Well, it's, I'll give you an example. I just talked to a beekeeper who's a northern beekeeper who, uh, from North Dakota, South Dakota, North Dakota border. Um, they have extremely harsh winters, and he runs he runs 12,000 colonies, so he makes 12,000 colonies in the springtime for honey production. That's a lot of bees, mm -hmm. but he knows his winters are so harsh and that he can't. There's no way he can get them all through the winter. So what he'll do is he'll he'll take 4,000 of his best colonies at the end of his honey season, which is coming up, and he'll move those down to Texas for the winter. So it's much milder in East Texas than North Dakota. So he takes 4,000 and he leaves the rest up there and if they freeze to death and die, so what? Um, I'll just pick up my equipment and whatever. And then what he'll do is in the springtime, he'll go down to Texas and take those 4,000 colonies and see the bloom in Texas, East Texas. They're going to start getting rich, nutritious food in February, March. The bees will start growing really fast. Their colonies will just explode. And then what the beekeepers do is they can split colonies in half or sometimes thirds 
and they raise their own queens. They can make queens, and each unit they split off can give, be given a new queen, and you got a new colony. So they could take those 4,000 colonies and make 12,000 new ones by the time we get to May, and then they take them up to North Dakota to make honey production, and the cycle starts again. So beekeepers know how to basically grow colonies large in the springtime, split them, and add new queens, and create new colonies. And they're very good at it. That's what they do well. Um, how, do the, how do the various beekeepers um, communicate with each other? I guess what I'm getting at is, um, you know, many different parts of the industry, over time there's a kind of a collection of best practices. So maybe that, so how, to, you know, how to minimize the turmoil, how to minimize the stress on bees. Is there, is there a way or a forum, or is, does that really fall to uh, folks like yourself in extension to try to, to knit these communities together and talk to them about best practices for, um, you know, maintaining bees and, and, and transporting them? Well, certainly, um, as an extension person, I can provide you info, but I'll be honest with you, the commercial beekeepers that have done this well uh, mm -hmm. and been doing their whole life, they basically are become the model citizens for the new commercial. So it's more of the commercial beekeepers teaching each other. Um, okay. It's not like a, a true apprenticeship, but that's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, and we have two audiences in our beekeeping world. We have commercial guys who make a living, and then we have this huge group of, of growing population of people who just are interested in bees as a hobby. And that group of people has skyrocketed. And they're the people who need me the most. Um, but when it comes down to it, a commercial beekeeper is more likely to listen to another commercial beekeeper than he is to me. <laughs> and it's because these two audiences, you can imagine a hobbyist beekeeper has a different set of priorities than a commercial beekeeper who's trying to make a living and sets the bottom line. Um, so there's just different perspectives, but, but they, I, think, I think they do a pretty good job of communicating their trade among people that are truly interested in becoming like them. So, uh, and a lot of time beekeeping families are what's involved here. You know, generations of, of people from the same family have been keeping bees commercially and they, they learned the, the profession from the, the previous generation. And so, I, th I think that's where the wisdom of, of how to keep bees and reduce the stress in, in your commercial operation comes from. It's from the commercial beekeepers themselves mostly. We can provide some input, but they're mostly coming, you know, family farm kind of thing is what's happening most of the time. Is there, um, I guess I should know this, but is there a, a discipline for, um, you talked about making colonies, but is there a discipline for breeding bees, I mean, is there any oh yes, yes. any effort being done to maybe breed bees that would be re more resistant to some of these viruses, and uh, or perhaps um, um, you're not not as likely to be colonized by some of these uh, vectors that move the viruses. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm known for. Um, when I was at the Baton Rouge Honey Bee Lab, our assignment was to breed honeybees that were resistant to the varroa mite, and. Um, we had two programs there that developed two two very different product lines that were resistant to the parole mite. And uh, so that research is there. And then we do have a long history of bee breeding in the United States. And um, uh, we have family systems in California in particular in Georgia now. We used to have a lot more in the southeast. And then Varroa came, and a lot of people went under because Varroa was so virulent when it first came. It wiped out a lot of people overnight almost, it seemed. But... We have, we have generations of queen breeders and queen producers in California in particular, and they're very good at selecting bees for things like high honey production, gentleness, they don't sting a lot, and they're very good at that selection. They've been doing that kind of selection for, for decades, and you can tell the difference. If, if you buy, you could buy some of the queens from the California bee, and you cannot believe how gentle they are. You can almost kick the calling and not get stung. And then, and then I can take you to some other stocks that aren't highly selected, and they'll beat you up and take your lunch money. <laughs> so, so our breeders are pretty good at, at things that they can measure easily, which is honey production and stinging. What's difficult is the, the way we select for disease resistance, we haven't been able to transfer from the scientific community to them very well because the things we ended up measuring for mite resistance are very difficult to measure and it's not easily transferable. And that's been one of the frustrations I've had as a scientist is we actually have some very decent resistant stocks and it would be nice to transfer that technology, that ability to, to produce that resistance to the breeders so they could do their own thing. But we've been kind of hampered with that. Mm. Not easy. 
jumping around a little bit, you mentioned uh, during your slide presentation that um, you know growers uh, could help themselves a lot um, by just doing, or help the bee populations uh, by just doing their treatments at night, um, uh, so that it has time to to dissipate. Uh, during the evening and the early morning before the bees actually get active around the middle part of the day. Right. Um, how practical is that? I mean, it's not. How, <laughs> how is that communicated, I guess, you know? Well, it's not very practical, so that's number one. So what, what we're going to be happy with is, um, uh, so here's the thing we, we've kind of discovered is, and, and it's well known too, that honeybees tend to forage maximally between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. in our summertime around here. So we, we understand that there's no, there's going to be no night application. There's no way anybody's going to get in a $2 million airplane and try and fly. It's just too dangerous. Right. So, so that's not going to happen. Uh, and, and the fact is, with our farms here, um, we have, you know, the average family farm here is more than 10,000 acres in the Delta. They're not, going to, mm -hmm. they're not going to apply things with ground rigs. They're going to use the plane. So the best we can hope for is if they can go as late in the day uh, out of the window as, if they can, uh, so if we can get an application, at, so but here's what happens is these guys in the planes, they tell me they're going to have to get out at 8 o'clock in the morning to get their orders done, and, and that's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So here's sort of the compromise solution I'm seeing happening is, is this. Many farmers are willing to apply ground rigs in and around the bees themselves to avoid drift onto the apiaries and then let the planes handle the rest. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a way to try and keep the drift and the acute kills, the acute bee kills down by, you know, just trying to, to apply differently closer to the bees. And that seems to be working on some farms, but not everybody's able to do it. And so what the beekeepers have to do is, un and it just depends on the situation, most of them are smart enough to try and get their bees under canopies of trees and off mm -hmm. the field edges to protect them from drift. And um, Whatever, the, the, the families that are in the Delta getting soybean honey, they've been doing it for generations, and they've figured out the best ways to protect their bees. And the, and the losses from acute kills are actually pretty light. Um, since I've been here, I only know of one kill of 60 colonies that was reported. Okay. So it's, okay. it's not like it happens uh, every day. But, okay. uh, but I think okay. it's more from beekeeper, beekeeper and farmer cooperation in placing the bees at the safest place possible. And it's really hard for the applicators to do what we would like to, to do, uh, evening applications or, or late afternoon. But some try, you know, but it's just not practical for most of these farms. How does this kind of training take place? I mean, again, is this part of what you do as extension and other universities do? Well, uh, it, it, to, to make sure that this, you know, that at least, there's a, you know, you got to create awareness before people can begin. Exactly. So, about, right. So. so. That's right. So what we did, uh, so I'm involved, some of the names on this slide here, Dr. Angus Ketchot is our, one of our row crop experts, and Dr. Jeff Gore and Don Cook, they work with me. These are guys who, who are basically the entomologists that help with soybeans, cotton, and many of the other agronomic crops here. We, we have formed a team here at Mississippi State, and then we do it through our Farm Bureau, but we basically have tried to create a... Um, a honeybee stewardship program where we get the farmers, we get the aerial applicators, and we get the beekeepers in the same room, and we do this two or three times a year and, and talk about, and we develop sort of, our initial thing was just to get them to talk, because some of these guys, some of these farmers that had beekeepers on their farms for years and didn't even know their name. They recognized the truck when they drove up, but they didn't know their name, you know? Mm -hmm. And so our first job, and we've been at it about three years now, was just to get them to talk and then we try and meet and talk about the best ways to approach, and we give standard protocols to approach uh, communicating with one another and, and protecting bees as best we can. And uh, like you said, keep the awareness up in between the groups. And um, we've been hard at doing that for the last three years, um, just trying to improve the environment. And, you know, we got some now, we got some farmers and beekeepers that are now hunting fishing buddies, you know, and that's what we want. We'd rather see that than armed camps getting ready to shoot one another, <laughs> you know. So it, it's one of those things you just got to keep pecking at it. You got to keep in, improving the communication between these two groups, make them understand they need one another. The beekeepers in particular need the farmers here because we do rely so much on soybean honey in our commercial operation. Um, so it's having this understanding and keep the dialogue is all we can do, and, and that's what we try and do. We've been talking about honeybees, but you also mentioned uh, bumblebees, I think, and and leaf cutters, and, and I might have missed it, but how, commercially, how important are they? And are there other 
you know, considerations for those bees uh, that fall out of honeybees that, that are also we need to create awareness around. Yeah, uh, well, so I, I, I kind of tangentially hit on it when I showed the value of honeybee pollination at $19 billion, and then there was another almost $10 billion yep. from non-apis. Well, that non-apis is mostly leaf cutters and bumblebees, uh, but you're right. Uh, so these neonics, as I mentioned, the one field study that I thought was done pretty well in nature suggested that, for example, that neonics certainly can have an effect on them out of seed treatments, and canola in particular could be other crops as well. But then if you just look at these, these insects are important um, for many crops. So, for example, honeybees are not the best pollinators of blueberries. They're at the individual flower level. Honeybees are not really good, but so many bees try it, they end up efficiently pollinating the crop, whereas some of the native bees, like the southeastern blueberry bee, is much more efficient at pollinating um, a, a blueberry flower because they are basically more closely evolved with it, and, and they've designed to pollinate that plant, and they're better at it. Um, and then there are other issues, like if in our bumblebee industry, we've had some issues with disease. Uh, it's, it's a very similar problem. Um, our eastern honeybee, Bombus impatiens, has been sort of um, marketed and you know, sold and can be used in greenhouse pollination. You can buy a colony of bumblebees and pollinate crops in a greenhouse. And that market in industry has actually accidentally spread a fungal disease. They have a nosema disease in bumblebees, and they accidentally spread it to some western honeybees, bumblebee species, and actually some of them may be extinct now because of that disease. So mm. it was unintentional, but commercial production of bumblebees actually led to spread of a disease to western bumblebee species and, and led to it threatening them. So it's all a mess. Even their industry has just got its problems. They've got disease problems. They've got pesticide problems. I mean, uh, it's just all a mess. And, and one thing we should mention is that when you look at an animal like a honeybee and they're infected by a virus related to varroa mite, it makes them more sensitive to pesticides and other things than they would normally be. So uh, the, just the presence of, of uh, the viruses or diseases, other diseases, can actually make the immune system and the, or the system that they use to handle uh, toxins in their environment more vulnerable and less able to handle things. So. It's all interconnected. When you have high varroa mite levels, your bees are actually more susceptible to things like pesticides than they normally would be. So it's all a mess. Disease interacts with pesticide and vice versa. Uh, right. But clearly, if you ask most bee scientists in this country, if you could take care of the varroa problem, a lot of our other problems would go away if you could really take care of that. These biological systems are always so complex, and we... We seem to have a tendency to try to break them out and look at them as individual problems when, in fact, it's uh, it's like, you know, pushing a balloon full of water, right? You push it in one place and it goes out in another place, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yep. Um, a question I wanted uh, to ask, and it's probably the last question uh, for you today, Jeff, is um, if you were a fresh produce grower that relied on bees, um, what, what should you look for? In a, in a pollination company that you're going to use, I mean, what are the what are the top two or three things? Um, because essentially, you're partners uh, in a way. And you mentioned before that you're trying to get folks together now to get to know each other better and get to know each other's needs. But if I'm a if I'm a, an almond grower in California, um, um, what should I be looking for in a pollination partner? What kind of information do I need to have? What kind of um, um, you know? keys should I have for making some of my decisions on who to work with? Well, that's interesting because, uh, so what, almonds is kind of, it's it, it, being the biggest player in the pollination game, they've actually are starting to handle this or been handling this themselves pretty well. And that is they get a middleman, a broker. And the broker, so contracts are signed between the beekeeper, the commercial beekeeper and the grower, and, and it, it, the contract may say something like this. Um, this contract, this beekeeper will bring 10,000 colonies of certain size and quality uh, mm -hmm. to this operation by this date, so he's so many days in front of the bloom. And then it's the job of the middleman, the broker, to actually go in and randomly sample the bee colonies and make sure that they meet the size and quality standards that were met in the contract. So and there, there are ways of going into a bee colony and saying, yeah, there's about, oh, six to eight frames of bees here, and which means a certain value, you know. And, and, and what happens is in these contracts, if the beekeeper brings in a, a colony that's under quality, he can be penalized on his rental fee. 
And then yeah, on the other hand, many of these brokers um, will actually uh, get a bonus to, to beekeepers that bring in stronger units. So that's, that's almonds, and they're probably the only ones that really do that. So for someone who's growing apples, I think it's going to be more word of mouth, and this is what happens in areas. So I, I know, for example, some apple growers up in New York, and there's a family up there, you know, Merrimack Valley Apiaries. Um, they're well known. They've been there for 30 years pollinating crops, and they have a great reputation for producing, you know, bringing bees in, being timely, uh, and having bees colonies that are strong enough to pollinate the uh, apple. So unless you're willing to evaluate the condition of the bees yourself, you kind of have to go word of mouth by seeing other apple growers in your area and see if they use a pollinator and who they use. And they may have strong suggestions about who not to use if someone, for example, is not a good cooperator or mm -hmm. has damaged trees or whatever or just bought in bees that didn't do the job. Uh, but that's kind of where it may be with some crops. It's just certain word of mouth. Um, and, and people, beekeepers know their reputations are built upon their ability to, to pull through and bring in colleagues, you know. So they, they, a lot of beekeepers take pride into delivering that service well. And those guys will stand out and, and they will be known in an area. So it's kind of crude, but it may end up ultimately being word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Does it work the other way around, I wonder? I mean, do um, certain beekeepers, um, do they have the flexibility or do they have the freedom to, to select the growers they might want to work with? I mean, I can imagine from what we've talked about, you know, the, the practices, the way the chemicals are used, the, the time frames, all of those kinds of things are, are pretty darn important, I would guess. And, and also, I guess, having environments around the field where you can safely you know, basically set up the hives and everything is also going to be important. So do, do they, does that enter into yeah. um Yes, decision? it does. Yeah, it does. I, I, in fact, I, I had this conversation last night with some beekeepers who, who, were, um, who were doing some pollination service on a certain almond farm in California, and they didn't like the fact that these guys were tank mixing, which is um, uh, basically mixing a, a fungicide, insecticide, and maybe a growth regulator or something all at one time. And this, this, when you start doing that kind of stuff, you can have dramatically horrible effects on honeybees. Um, sure. And, uh, and this particular farm did this despite their objections, and they lost a lot of bees. And so they're groaning and moaning, and other beekeepers are hearing, and they're saying, well, we're not going to that farm, you know, and that, that's just the way business goes, you know. And, yeah. and so, yeah, it, it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, um, Jeff, I'd like to I'd like to thank you very much uh, for joining us on today's webinar. I know I learned a tremendous uh, amount uh, listening to you and looking at your slides and having this conversation, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, so we thank you all on, uh, on in the audience as well for joining us today for our, our webinar, and we hope that the information that we provided you will help you make some decisions in the future. Um, about, um, first of all, how to, how to inter interact with the pollination business, but also to understand a little bit more about some of the facts associated with the use of, of pesticides, in particular uh, neonics, and maybe gave you uh, some clues and some hints on, you know, how to um, be able to use these tools and yet, um, you know, make sure that we uh, continue to sustain uh, healthy uh, and productive uh, honeybee populations. Again, I'd like to especially thank uh, Jeffrey Harris for his excellent insights into the research programs we discussed. And if you have any additional questions or comments, I know oftentimes you get thinking about these things and there's something that you might want to ask or wish that I had asked, uh, please uh, don't hesitate um, to contact us uh, with the information that you, you see on the screen. Or you can email me at bwhitaker uh, at pma.com. Uh, this uh, webinar was recorded and it will be available on PMA.com uh, the week of October 3rd. Uh, so if you want to go back and check on some things that might have been said, uh, you can certainly go on our website and check it at that time. Uh, just also draw your attention to the fact that PMA will be holding its next science and technology session. Uh, they'll be during the 2016 Fresh Summit um, Exposition and Conference, which will be on Friday, October 14th uh, in Orlando, Florida. And we, uh, we certainly hope to see you there. So this concludes today's webinar, and I'd like to thank you again for your participation.